This is Marvin McFadden, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John and Pete. Yes, with us tonight at Bayview Studios, this is what I call my kitchen table, Marvin McFadden, trumpet player extraordinaire, Bay Area musician for a long, long time. Your looks betray the uh, veteran status uh, with which you've been blowing the trumpet, man. Did you hear this, Pete? I asked Marvin. He asked me about Felton being on our show, and I said, oh, yeah, do you work with Felton very often? And he said, I was on five Confunction albums. And you yes. honestly don't look old enough to have played on five Confunction albums. This is my first real gig out of high school. Uh, September, 19, I graduated in 79. I played three shows at the old Circle Star Theater with Confunction. The Circle Star, yeah. man. Yeah. You know what's interesting to me about the Circle Star is that it is in San Carlos, which is a South Bay Peninsula kind of upscale city, but it was always kind of like an R&B venue. Definitely, yeah. I saw George Benson at the Circle Star. I saw Cameo Mm -hmm. at the Circle Star. Those are the kinds of bands. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I've also done at that venue uh, Temptations and OJs. Oh, wow. Wow. But it was, it was amazing. The first real gig I had, I'm 18 years old, and we get on, you know, it's with the theater in the round. Had you been to the Circle Star before that? No. Because it's a unique venue. Yeah, it's I mean, the, it's the circ- it's, they still have some of those on the East Coast. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, we play once in a while, but okay. there's not a bad seat in the house. Right. The stage rotates for our listeners' pleasure, uh, and that venue, the Circle Star in particular, has been closed for 20 years. It's now an office building. Wow, what a shame. Yeah. That's also the room where Prince and Sheila E. met. Just a little point of trivia. Anyway. Sheila E. was on my gig. And that, that first she one. Was she was on that was, first she gig. Was playing for, well, Sheila Escovito. She wasn't Sheila E. yet. Right. Yeah. But just you, you and Sheila, both kids at the time. Yeah. Oh, well, she was already a savvy pro. Yeah. I was a kid. Okay. Yeah. But she might have been just a couple years older. But she was a savvy. But she, she was, was a savvy pro. G- yeah, gigging right. probably since she was thirteen. Yeah, yeah. So how, with, how old with were the you likes of George Duke. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So how old were you at that point? Eighteen, just 18. out of high school. Wow, yeah. and that's pretty damn good because I mean you're blowing a horn to stand out. That's yeah. A- Where'd you go to school? Vallejo High. You went to Vallejo High. Yeah. So when you graduated from Vallejo High, you were already undoubtedly familiar, or I should say, Confunction was already undoubtedly familiar with you. Mm. No, they weren't. Uh, it was, it was kind of a weird audition that I had. Uh, they, uh, Felton came up to Solano College looking for trumpet players. I went and auditioned and, you know, they the hired good, me. The yeah. old fashioned way. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. went and auditioned for the gig yeah. and you won it. Yeah. And then you played at the Circle Star. And then, uh, what happened after that? Was well, there a- then they just kept calling me. I mean, I, like I say, I played on five of their albums, toured with them for, you know, about five years. And I was a, a supplement. They right. had they had a trumpet and a trombone. A lot, you know, Felton played trombone, but he also sang. Carl Fuller, their trumpet player, is a great trumpet player, but he did a lot of singing, so he couldn't play the trumpet. You know, so full time. So, yeah, exactly. So they just had us to kind of sweeten the horn sound. You've really made a living as a sweetener. I've made an existence as a sweetener. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> as many horn players do. I mean, your job in the grand scheme of rock and roll is to. Take a band that sounds great and make them even greater. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like you're, when you think about rock and roll trumpet, it's like people don't grow up. I'm going to be a rock and roll trumpet player. You know, you play rock and roll in the trumpet and the world's your oyster. It's just, it's just not, they don't make sense together. So hopefully I add, I mean, they could do without it. So I'm sure that I do add, I'm, it, I'm worth the, the money that they're paying. And that's what it comes down to is you have to be worth the money. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you do make it better. I mean, we had Mick to let on the show that you were talking about before and he, they were I hate to be up. a dick, but I have to say these words because I'm laughing at them. Yeah. You're not the first trumpet player for Huey Lewis in the news we've had on the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's, I'm sorry. No, but just, I was going to tell the story about how mix off stage are warming up, you know, just loud enough they can be able to hear. But the Stones are playing live, mm-hmm. and Mick, Mick Mick Jagger stops the show and says, "Get out here," and changed the entire way they they tour with that song. So, don't downplay your yeah. They were up. playing. What were they playing? I think they were playing Satisfaction, yeah. and mm-hmm. so the the horns, the Tower of Power horn section. Bill Graham had them back in the back and said, "Just hang out. We'll bring you out for a song." Right. And so they were just back pecking. 
and satisfaction came on, and so they just kind of made a spot arrangement, mm-hmm. and Mick Jagger heard it and pulled them out on stage. And that remains their arrangement for satisfaction. Wow. So I think what happens, if we're to learn a lesson from this story, is that a band like the Rolling Stones, or in your case, Huey Lewis and the News, gets a horn section and goes, oh, yeah, we're not letting go of these guys. Well, you know, when I first got the gig with them, it was ni- March of 94 we started. And I thought, man, if I could have this gig for two years, that'd be great. Oh, yeah. You know, now we're on our 23rd year. I mean, yeah. it's, you're right. They don't change horses very often. I yeah. Mean, it's like a... They're very good to us. Wow. Yeah. That's quite a few years. Yeah, yeah. What's it like being on the road with Hugh Lewis? Because, you know, it's one thing if you're a band that's going out there and kind of slogging it out and going from town to town and playing on a Tuesday in Tulsa and a Wednesday night in Kansas City. and But I have a feeling you guys don't travel that way. We do. We we travel. We do one-nighters all the time. But, you know, we have nice tour buses. We have a couple of tour buses. You know, they're like Madden cruisers on, you know, mm-hmm. steroids. Oh boy. You know, they've, you know, you've got the, uh, satellite TV, you know, internet and all that, all that stuff. And the hotels that we stay at, we, you know, there's four guys, uh, the original guys in the band, the partners of the band. Uh-huh. And we always stay at the same hotels as them. We do the same flights. They treat us, you know. You're in the band. Yeah. yeah well, except we have no decision making power, but, okay. but we have all the status that they've granted us. You right. Know? Yeah. So it's, I'm on their health insurance. You know, they've got a retirement fund set up for us. You know, it's it's not like a regular band. And That's they, pretty and sweet. They, and they do all these things not because they have to. Right. Not because they have to. Yeah. And it seems like everything I've ever heard about Huey Lewis and the guys, that that's the way they do it. You know, mm-hmm. We're going to go out and we're going to go make money, but we're not going to go out on Greyhound buses. You know, right. Oh, gonna, yeah, yeah. You know, we're, this is what we do for each other for, as mm-hmm. a family. You yeah. Know, you're part of the family. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't get to vote, but you're part of the family. I, I found out this morning, I got an itinerary. We're leaving on Thursday for about 10, 11 days. And we've got a night off in New York City, mm-hmm. Tuesday night. And I... I usually, I'll, on days off, I'll go to either museums or try and go to ball games or something like that. And so I see the A's are playing in at Yankee Stadium on that Tuesday night. So I call up the the drummer Bill, who has season tickets at the A's. He goes, Marvin, we're going. You know, yeah. he got us got his tickets. So nice. I'm going to Yankee Stadium on Tuesday night. You know, and wow. that's it's these guys. They're they're like that. They think about us a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of camaraderie. I mean, you've been there 23 years. This, on my 23rd year. On your 23rd. That's a long time to do anything. Yeah, yeah. And it's definitely a long time to do anything in the music business. Yeah. Well, fortunately, you know, I mean, these guys are living the dream, right? They wrote the songs. They're playing every night songs that they wrote. Right. And fortunately for me, I love all the songs that they wrote, too. Yeah. I mean, well, that was the same thing with Confunction. Yeah. You know, I love their music, too. And the similarities between the two bands, the reason why both were wildly successful is their work ethic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... I remember when I was 18, having to leave a rehearsal, uh, walk, they, they had a place down in Vallejo, the Melody. Right. Uh, do you know where that is? Just, just kind of, uh, uh south of Nation's Burgers. Uh huh. We'd walk down and, and go get lunch and come back while the, the guys in the band were still working on vocals. They were working on vocals and we'd come back in an hour and a half later and they're still working on the same thing. I mean, they were working their butts off. And it's the same thing with Huey and the News. Their their work ethic is like second to none. And that's, you know, they've all got talent, but it's a matter of the passion and of working that hard and trying that hard. And both bands work that hard. Yeah. Well, that seems to be the common thread of anything. Mm -hmm. What about when you guys do horn arrangements? How frequently in those 22 years have your horn arrangements changed? Any kind of changes are just like minimal changes, usually yeah. to go with the change of an arrangement of something. You know, I mean, if you go Power of Love, it's it's the same horns that yep. you're, you know, people want to hear the same thing, yeah. you know, and, and, that, we don't, and we don't get bored with it. You know, I mean, it's like you try and play it perfect each time. So right. it's not like you're getting bored or anything. I, we don't need to change it for us. The only time that they would change it is if they thought it would help a new arrangement of that song. Yeah. So yeah. You know, the horn arrangements don't change that much. How often do you play it perfectly, do you think? Is it like, I mean, Carl Lewis never ran the perfect 100 meters. Like, right. We can't tell. Yeah. But you can. You know the difference. Yeah. What do you think? Well, if the guys in the band are listening, then I play it perfect every, every time. time. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, no, I've never played it perfect. 
Right. Yeah. Right, right. And that's sure. another mark of that. You know, you're a craftsman. Mm. You know, you could say, yeah, I, I played a C before. Mm -hmm. It counted off and it's off. But you, you know, for you, for mm -hmm. what you want to do, that's impressive. Man. Yeah. Do you get a solo in the show? Once in a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just think, you know, when you're doing a show that's got that number of hits, absolutely. When, as a concert goer, you know, we show up to hear the song that we want to hear. And, yeah. And these songs are milestones in people's lives. Exactly. You know, you're not just playing the power of love. You're playing, this is what we walked into our wedding venue to, or something like that, you yes. know, something of that nature. And when you're playing that kind of song, that you absolutely have to hit the notes and, and do all those things. But if you take that arrangement and twist it just a little bit, then you make the guy who goes... Hey, I've seen Huey Lewis in the news five times over the last 10 years, and it seems like there's something a little different every time. Mm -hmm. So when you make those subtle changes, because you've been in the band 22 years, do you think they're subtle to you, but not necessarily subtle to us? Oh, maybe that, that could be. Yeah. Because I've never yeah. heard anybody well, go, Oh yeah, I saw Huey Lewis again. It's the same as the well, last the, time. They, I saw uh, the band is always writing new material. We're always, it's not a show where you show up and you just hear the hits. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's new stuff all the time. Fans will get to hear that too, I think. Yeah. So there's freshness baked into. There's freshness, but for us, or for me anyway, you know, playing these tunes that I like, I mean, it's, it's fresh anyway. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, I'm living the dream. Yeah. I really am. You know, I mean, it's a, I'm fortunate to be able to do what I do with this band. This is the guy who said he was going to come on the show and it was going to be real boring. boring. Um, so <laughs> who else have you played with? Cause you mentioned the Temptations and the OJs. Oh, yeah, I didn't know you yeah. played with them at all. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, a lot of those old different groups like that, you know, yeah. Donna Summer, I played, at the, when I was a kid, 20, 21, there was the Venetian room up at the Fairmont. Yeah. And I backed up Ella Fitzgerald and Mel Torme. Wow. Cab Calloway, you know, yeah. James Brown, you know, a bunch, of, bunch of different people, like Natalie Cole, wow. you know, a bunch of different people. You just saw a lot of incredible dead people too. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah right. I mean, that's how long yeah. you've been at it. Yeah. You yeah. know, these people have all passed and yeah. they're all icons. Yeah. 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 James Brown. Holy yeah. Cow. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about a taskmaster. Yeah. 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 Well, there's a joke too. You know, James Brown would literally fine uh, his band five dollars for a missed a note or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, anytime there's like a little clam, you know, uh, Johnny Cola, who's a big prankster, yeah, you know, will turn around one of the horn players and flash five fingers like you're fine. Oh, that's but, what it is. But, He's flashing the yeah, fine. But, but never, you know. I mean, there you it's go. Just, it's I heard that. Joke. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just yeah. to let you know it was Wait, there. Johnny Cola's funny. I yeah. can't buy that for a second. <laughs> Johnny Cola, he grew up around here too, right? Went to Armio? Yeah, his dad was mayor of Sassoon. No okay. Kidding. Yeah. Uh -huh. I met his dad one time. Did you really? Yeah, I was a DJ in the uh, early 90s, and I was at the Green Valley Country Club. And I want to say his dad's a member at the Green Valley Probably. Country Club. Yeah. Because I'd see him all the time, and then somebody introduced me to him at some point, because he's a little charismatic himself. Oh, yeah. He, he's very good, yeah. So, anyway, when... uh you're a kid and you start playing with those people. I mean, I know it's not lost on you that you're in the room backing up Ella Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. What do you do to get more of those gigs? I mean, how did you, let's rewind and start at the beginning. What? Yeah. Well, the only gig I ever auditioned for was that confunction gig. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, and the, the rest is all kind of word of mouth. After you know? that, it just carried through and everybody knew they were getting Marvin McFadden. Well, you know, I, I guess, you know, I did have to make phone calls and I mo mostly call up other trumpet players. And the one thing about trumpet players, no matter Mick Gillette, as great as he is, yeah. there's one thing he couldn't do is be in Play two places. Play two notes at the same yeah, time? Oh. No, be in two places at the same time. Right, yeah. You know, say, hey, Mick, you know, if there's anything you can't fit into your schedule, you know, can you pass my name out? Hook a brother up. Glad to do it, yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, that's uh, a lot of it became uh, word of mouth. You guys too. must have known each other pretty well, huh? I took lessons from Mick when I was 18. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Tell us about that. Well, uh, Mick is, I mean, what, about the lessons or about just, him? Just the experience, yeah, of working with him. Well, I mean, I remember he changed my life. There's been a couple of times as a trumpet player, a young trumpet player, that the trumpet becomes redefined, you know, and I listen to something and it's like, no. I've had it all wrong all this time. A trumpet can't do that, yeah. you know? And Mick Gillette was one of the first ones to do that to me. I'm, I, I was listening and it's like, it literally took my breath away to hear what he was doing. I said, I got to have some of that, you know? So I went over to his house a few times. Uh, he lived off of uh, El Portal uh -huh. and, um, 
uh, went over to his house for uh, a few lessons, and it was more more hanging out and playing together than it was a lesson, you know. But it was uh, it was just to hear him play. This guy trumpet is a wind instrument. Here's the boring part, okay? Uh, <laughs> trumpet is a wind instrument, so you, you need know to, how many music yeah. nerds listen to this show. <laughs> and when Mick would play, if you watched him from behind, his back would swell, almost like a great big, like you know, if you were had an accordion and you could pull it out as far as you can. The chamber, I mean, yeah, the chamber I mean, and expanded. It's just, I mean, it's just this massive amount of air. I mean, it's just the volume of air that he would take in. Yeah, you know, is was just no one else has done that. There I mean, are some people naturally attuned to a task yeah and he had that going for him yeah i had a different experience i took lessons from dave garibaldi when i was 18 uh-huh. yeah and uh i remember he said play something and i sat down at his red yamaha kit and i uh, proceeded to play squib cakes badly uh-huh. and uh he didn't acknowledge that i played squib cakes badly and proceeded with the lesson but uh honestly I had the same experience in that it was amazing being in the room with him and he'd show me how to play something and then I'd try to play it. And I was a little less successful at the hanging out and playing the drums with Dave part of it, except that he really did also change my playing, mm-hmm. profound change in my playing just in the subtle things, dynamics and the discipline with which I even sit down at a drum set. Yeah. And those guys are all that. I mean, Tower of Power, all those old school bands that we grew up with, including Confunction. Right. They're all those sort of taskmasters. When we had Felton on the show, I was really good friends. Actually, my first roommate, when I rented a place by myself, my first roommate was a guy named Derek Willis. Mm -hmm. I met Derek. He passed away, didn't he? Yeah, Yeah, he did. He did. And at the time that we were, I think we were seniors in high school and he worked at Fellstar and we would just get to witness the way that Felton operated Mm -hmm. and just the discipline and cleanliness, you know, with which he, he operated. And he felt like that was the best way to get the best out of everybody. Absolutely. We all wanted to work hard for him. Plus he could hear grass grow. I mean, his ears were just so amazing. He could hear things that you know, normal people can't hear, but he'd go about it in a way, uh, asking you to do something, you know, especially in the studio, in a nice way, not like a challenging way, like, you know, you better do this or your phony baloney career is over. Uh But it's like, oh, yeah, okay, great, Felton. Yeah, I want to do that for you. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's the mark of great production. Our episode that just came out today was uh, Preston Glass. Mm -hmm. Worked with Felton quite a bit, but he's been a producer for many, many years, and he was just saying that, you know, a lot of times it's staying out of the way. But when you prod somebody, you got to prod them in a way that allows for their own creativity to sort of come alive. And mm-hmm. it's not about getting somebody to execute something. It's about leaning back and having them execute it. And it makes all the difference. That's a good point. Yeah. If you like the show and you know you do, send us some pictures of your movies. Don't do that. Support the show. There are three ways you can support us. Number one, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a five-star rating in with you. It helps with the show metrics and helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. How busy are you guys? Like how often do do you go out? This band, Huey and the News, they play between, I want to say, 75 and 95 gigs a year. So, uh, you know, a lot of them are corporate gigs. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, we're going out. We leave Thursday and get home a week from the following Sunday. We do, uh, I don't know, about eight gigs, something like that, you know. So they're they're busy. They like playing. I mean, I know that Huey wants to take time off once in a while to hang out at his place in Montana, but they like doing what they do. I didn't know that you guys were that busy. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot of playing. It's a lot of gigs, yeah. I sort of was under the impression because, of course, the only thing I see, like you said, you do a lot of corporate gigs. So the only thing I see is, oh, look, Huey Lewis in the news back at the Saratoga Mountain Winery. Mm-hmm. And by the way, only the nicest joints. I mean, when you see a Huey Lewis in the news show, 
you guys don't play at shabby joints. Mm hmm. Well, let's face it. People our age, they want nice cush seats. Uh-huh. You know, the right. people like you know, <laughs> right. ballet they want parking. To drink wine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, do you want to stand in a vomitorium and have your ears bleed? You know, not not people our age. Yeah, that's true. That's Thirty true. years ago, we did. <laughs> <laughs> the willingness. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, just to go see some music. I mean, I think that's the thing that I'm happiest about when we talk about all of our musical influences from our age. You know, and how they've aged. You can say that Huey Lewis in the News is among the top. I mean, mm-hmm. there are a lot of it. Flock of Seagulls, let's say, mm-hmm. or something like that. I mean, where it's not even adamant. Adamant. Or, or, yeah, it's in it's time. Great music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By the time you get out here now, it's like, oh man. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wasn't even talking about that. No, I was just I talking like about the the caliber of venue. You know that you mm-hmm. play. Oh, okay. To your point that. People our age, concert goers our age, just not willing to sit in a vomitorium. Yeah, yeah. Do you think Adam Ant still plays vomitoriums? <laughs> I, I think his music doesn't have the legs to not play vomitoriums. I'm not like Adam Ant, uh-huh. but um, I think that's what, you know. Yeah. When, when your crowd is willing to pay uh, for the cushy seats mm-hmm. and stuff and the uh, and $8 drinks, yeah, yeah, you can play better venues. So it, I think it speaks to the overall quality of the band, you know, what they do. Obviously, you guys are having fun on stage. Yes. And then that. I don't know, yeah. That, that, that has to, never waned. Yeah, that no. goes to a great, you know, the showmanship can always be there, even if your music isn't great, but your guys' music is, it's really timeless and great. And I think that creates the ability to go out and play these quality venues. Right, yeah. But you started your career playing places like the Fairmont. So it's not yeah, like yeah, you've yeah. done a, horn players don't play vomitorium. Well, no, no, see that the, the uh, Confunction was a real springboard for me. I yeah. mean, because I networked, I mean, in the Bay Area, that was the best gig to get. That was. And the some 18 year old kid from straight out of high school gets it, you know, so all of a sudden people knew who, who you is were. this guy, yeah. you know, I mean, some of them were jealous, you know, I, I play better than him or, you know, whatever, but at least my name got out. Uh-huh. And so it was really a springboard. I got other sessions from it. I got credibility too. What's funny, you know, I got the gig with Huey Lewis and immediately I was a much better player than I was the day before. You know, it's, yeah. just, it's just credibility. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. like baseball managers. They become dumb. Yeah. All of a yeah. sudden, you're like, well, I, I was a genius last year. What happened? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's the opposite effect. Cool. Yeah. yeah. No, my uh, my f- mother-in-law was Japanese, and she, you know, I'm working with Yuri Lewis in the news, but I'm a musician. So when is he going to be, you know, when's he going to get a real job? What's he going to do, you know? And I ended up playing some Japanese show on Knob Hill. And I thought, well, I'm going to get this. This She was like a big pop star in Japan. I'm going to get her autograph, get her to sign this, uh-huh. you know, to Keiko, you know, from whatever her name was. Right. And uh, maybe I'll score some points. So I'm, I'm walking out. You know, it was a great big orchestra. And I see my mother-in-law in the lobby. She had come to the show. She didn't look back and see the orchestra. She goes, Marvin, what are you doing? And I said, well, I was, I was playing show. lead trumpet. Yeah. yeah. And she goes, yeah. And all her chest pops up, and all of her friends. This is my son-in-law. He was playing in the. Or- we were just talking about how good the orchestra <laughs> credibility immediately. Yes. Okay, he can play. Right. He, you know, now you're Lewis okay. in the news. All the other people. Ah, well, I don't know about that, but you know, so this this <laughs> Japanese star all of a sudden yeah. credibility. Yeah. Wow, that's funny. I was uh, on a plane once. I found myself in first class on a flight from Tokyo to Guam, and uh, across the aisle from me was this guy who was. He looked like a Japanese prince. He was wearing some, you know, like he had some clothes on that were not normal clothes. He right. looked like he was uh, wearing stage clothes from a funk band, but he was on a plane. And his hairstyle was like, his hair was like a foot and a half high. And he was a Japanese guy, but he was sitting with a blonde American woman who was 20 years older than he was and clearly telling him what to do. So she must have been his manager or something. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you must be a Japanese pop star because these are $2,000 seats on this plane and you've got $4,000 worth of clothing on. And uh I never did get who that guy was. And that was a story about nothing. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> so you've played with some incredible people, obviously. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald, James Brown. Yeah, let's Natalie let's Cole. not let you stop. So mm-hmm. here yeah. you are. You get this great gig with mm-hmm. Confunction, and it immediately legitimizes you. And I will say that, let's see, what year did you graduate from high school? 79. 79. So here you are in 1979. 
moving into 1980, and I know that I was a band geek in the mid to late 80s, and everybody knew who you were at the time. So if we all knew who you were, then everybody knew who you were. So going from Confunction, what's next? Well, there was an, a lot of these things were happening at the same time. Confunction, and then it spidered off into a bunch of different things from that. You know, I mean, I, I did a recording session for Confunction, and uh, one of the guys that was on the recording session also did the 49er band. So I ended up doing the 49er band, you know, the one that was on the field uh -huh. uh, at the time, networking from there and then playing a rehearsal band. I got in a rehearsal band where a guy heard me and called me for the Venetian room. I, and so I, I did a lot of stuff up there. And then all the other it was just, uh, it just all spidered out a bunch of different things. I played for a band called Zazu Pitts Memorial yeah, Orchestra. Yeah, yeah. I played I with them Zazu for a, a number of years and they were a really busy band and, and it's all, it's all networking. It's, yeah. it's all, you know, I told Monica when we first got married, you know, there's three reasons for me to leave the house. One is to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, two is to network, which makes more money. And right. three is to have fun because, you know what, I didn't pick up the trumpet just to make money. I mean, it's, there's other better ways to make money than play the trumpets, but it's fun too. Yeah. So if I could do any one of those things gets me out of the house, any two or three makes it a great gig. Right. And so or early on, there was a lot of just the... uh the, the networking thing to, yeah. to get out there. And a lot of times, you know, never say no. I never said, I did a lot of salsa gigs, you know, I mean, not the money was fine, but it was more the networking and the fun of playing that kind of music. Too. Right. So, um, it's after confunction, it wasn't just one thing. It was, a yeah, bunch it wasn't of one thing things. that led yeah, to the right, next that led right. to the next. I played with Pete Escovito's band out of that, after yeah. the 49er band, out of the confunction thing, you know, so, um, there was, there, yeah, just, it, it all spidered so out after as, that. As things spider, and, and as your willingness to say yes is obviously critical to your success. And willingness to show up on time yeah, for things. Right, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So someone says... For the you young know, musicians out in the audience listening, check out Marvin. He's just getting uh, his name out there known for being a uh, great player. But the unsaid thing there is that as a as a musician of any sort, you gotta freaking show up. You gotta show up. You, you gotta be sober. You gotta oh, wear, that's, the, that's you gotta good wear too. the right clothes. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So so you might be at a salsa gig this night, you might be at a polka gig the next exactly. night. Exactly. How do you have enough clothes? How do you know how to play? Polka. Do you, when you show up, do you say you just wear sideman black, right? Yeah, side <laughs> black. Yeah, yeah, when all else unless, fails, unless they ask, yeah, unless they, you know, they'll tell you to what to wear. And then, yeah, yeah, do you ask for like a you know a songbook to, to read or a sight read? Or you no, know? you know, people will call me up for gigs, and I won't know if they're if they're charts mm -hmm. or if we're playing by rote or if we're faking or whatever. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter, right? You know, you. I, I mean, I remember people saying I would call up someone to sub for me when I got called up for something better. And I'd say, well, there's this gig. And they, well, are there charts to it? It's like, well, I don't know. I didn't ask. You know, yeah. it's because it didn't matter to I mean, me. You just got to be used yeah, to that. Yeah, you just, yeah. And some people, well, you have to be comfortable. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times, you know, I was in a, uh, grew up in a, a time where there were more than one trumpet player on a gig, too, a lot of times. Wow. So um, I would actually. Boy, those are days I, of old, I, huh? Yeah, they yeah. pretty much are. Yeah. But I would um, listen to the guys who knew all those tunes and learn tunes on the gig, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and just fake it with them as far as that goes. And so now, you know, it's like I know a gazillion tunes. Like If you guys called me up for your band, you know, I could come in and, and play. Well, any band that I would be in would be playing tunes that you played front, front and back for many, many years. Probably, yeah. But if you walked in on a salsa gig... You're walking in on a gig where, you know, you hear the, here it comes and the, yeah. from one style of music to the next, they all have their pattern where they, you know you can fall into place. Right. And salsa is, you know, like a lot of the swing gigs, the horn players like to lay back. Uh -huh. You know, they, that swing, you know, listen to Count Basie. Where mm -hmm. salsa and rock, you have to be really you on to top of forward. it. Yeah. And then on top of it with, with salsa, they, they've got, and I still don't understand the whole tumbao. I mm -hmm. mean, the, uh, clave. Clave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes it's two, three, sometimes it's three, two, and I don't get it. But then also the tumbao, when you first start playing salsa, the bass player will anticipate the next chord on beat four. So it's one, tkun, gun, tkun, gun, tkun. You know, the, the uh -huh. bass, the bass rhythm, the tumbao, they're on the end of two and on four, and beat four anticipates what the piano player is going to play that next bar. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, you don't know these things. You learn, you know, by getting out there and doing it. Right. And blowing it a couple times. And blowing it and a couple go, times. And then go, okay, no, no, no. Yeah, I'll yeah, come back yeah. on the next one. Yeah, well, you know, you're there and you're saying, oh, my 
goodness, where's beat one? You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hips yeah. are shaking. Yeah. Yeah. Sweats flying yeah. around. Yeah. Our guest number, I want to say guest number three was Derek Jones. Mm -hmm. And he, music nerded on us mm. and went far out into left field. Oh, I'm we sorry. Went, Did oh I just do that? What, what no, no, no. <laughs> that, no, 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 no. Most of the people Blondry. who listen to our show, honestly, oh. will understand the struggle of mm. finding, mm. you know, understanding the clave. And with salsa, it's not like funk where everything is just centered around one. Mm -hmm, right. You know, it's, well, we'll come back to one. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And salsa it's like you can't even dance without moving four body parts at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and all in different directions. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're the trumpet player and you show up to a gig, and you may show up to a gig and play for a guy who just doesn't even speak English. Right, right. And your common language is music. Yeah. That's probably the most beautiful thing that I think mm -hmm. uh, there is about being the kind of musician who could just walk into, yeah, sure, I'll take it. I'll go play the ramp with, you know, whoever on a Friday night. And right. How often nowadays do you take those just one-off gigs? I take them as whenever they're whenever I get called. Yeah, yeah. I haven't done a salsa gig in probably a year. Uh, just haven't been called. I, you know, when you say no enough times, and this is good for your young listeners too. When you say no, you stop getting called. Wow. And, and so you never say no if you are available. I mean, because there's plenty of times that you have to say no because you're already doing something else. You know, that whole Mick Gillette thing. I have to say no. And then they get people who play great, you know, that can make Who them. say yes yeah, all the time. Exactly. And right. un also bother to show up. And right. Stuff. Exactly. Great lesson, young musicians yeah. out there. Yeah. And young everybody out there. There is somebody to take your place. That's right. Yeah. So Felton told us a story of a time he was climbing the stairs for a gig. And he stomped on his trombone on accident. I wasn't there. I didn't. No, no, <laughs> yeah. no. But I mean, what, what's the uh, what's the fail safe if something like that does happen? If someone picks up your trumpet, and moves it across the stage, and you can't find it, and it's mm. game time. What do you do? Mm. I don't know. Yeah. You know that. Well, when I we do the, I've done a lot of the theater stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I did Jersey Boys and Book of Mormon, and you know, a lot of the shows that come into San Francisco, and usually I'll have a spare trumpet there, you know, because there's eight shows a week, you know, something, a spring is going to break, a valve is going to stick sure. or something like that. So I haven't had to, but you know, at least it's there as far as out on the, the road and something like that. I don't know. I, yeah. One of the guys we've had in the show too, he does a backstage management for the Eagles. And, and part of the thing he does is he eliminates a lot of that stuff. So mm -hmm. the trumpet always goes where the trumpet always goes. He knows mm -hmm. where it goes. It's always there. You yeah. Know, the keys are where the keys need to be. The, Kleenex box where the Kleenex box always is. So right. when you guys walk into a venue, all you're worried about is the gig. Yeah, the trumpet always stays with me, though. Does it? Okay. Yeah, so I actually always... practice in the hotel rooms. You know, between, you know, the hotels we stay at. The worst neighbor ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, only, the only time I've ever gotten yes. any complaints was when we've been at casinos and people have been out too late. They're, they're hungover and they oh, lost yeah. all their money and they're cranky. Yeah. But because usually the places that we'll stay at, you know, between 11, uh, AM and 3 PM, everybody's out doing touristy things. So I could just play to my heart's delight. The only people I bother are the band and, and they don't care. So when you do practice, what's your technique? Do you, do you get into show guard? Is it dress rehearsal in your room then? Or what no, do you do? it's, it's calisthenics. Uh, it's, yeah. I, I never practice this. You stuff just stay in shape. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Does your trumpet have a name? No. <laughs> <laughs> we should name it right now. Yeah, anthropomorphic. Yeah. yeah. That's a terrible yeah. name. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> to, to give it a name. Yeah. 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 Just call it Anna then. That's okay. Right. We'll call it Anna. Yeah, yeah. Your trumpet's name is Anna. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of trumpet do you play? Uh, just a box during the various, a uh, lightweight. Yeah. Oh, okay. So when I, um, you are, you probably remember the name, uh, Jeff Failer. Trumpet player. Where do I where do He's I remember from, the name from, Jeff Failer from? From, from Vallejo. Uh -huh. uh, he played in many singers uh, uh -huh. for a long time. Anyway, his dad sold me a trumpet in 1980, and I'm playing on that same trumpet now. No kidding! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And is it like a violin where there's like a, a class, like where anything they made by no, or whatever? Not 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 this. This is just a stock horn. I mean, I'm sure they've got designer horns. I have a student that uh, came to my house today. And he just spent forty one hundred dollars on on a new trumpet, and he let me play it, and it plays like forty one hundred dollar horn. I mean, mm. it's a, it's a it's a great horn. It's just that, you know, working musicians can't afford a forty one hundred dollar. <laughs> it's, it's guys that do it on the side that can do that. Wow, yeah. forty one hundred dollars yeah, worth yeah. of horn. Yeah, I mean, I got mine for. 
four hundred, five hundred dollars, something like that. In nineteen eighty. Yeah. You can yeah. you can buy your instrument for, for five hundred dollars and use it for your whole career and no one's gonna say yeah. I wish you had a whatever, a home yeah. playmaker or something. Well, you know, you always think there's something magical out there that's gonna make it easier, but ultimately there's not. Were yeah. you in many singers? Yeah. What year? I did you were in many singers too, right? I was. Uh I was in How do you know that? Because God, on the, I thought all that no, footage no, was gone. No, no. <laughs> Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did the 78 and 79 big oh, shows. Oh, 78 and yeah, 79. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I met my wife in many years. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. There are a few stories like that. Yeah. When was, let's see, 78 and 79. Lewis Brown? Lewis. No, Lewis was out by, I knew Lewis. Yeah. Uh, but he was out by 78. I, he was in, I think 77 was his last year. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when when you when the phone rings, what's the ultimate call? Like we've got whatever it is. Ronnie James Dio is on the line. You know he's gonna come. To- <laughs> Ronnie James Dio needs a trumpet player. Yeah, yeah. You know who? But who is it? Like where you're like, if this person called, I don't care what it is. My foot could be chopped off. I'm making that gig. Uh, for me, I think it would be Harry Connick Jr. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I try to see Harry Connick Jr. every time he comes to town, mm-hmm. and it's exactly for the reason that you you know, flip out if he called because his band is always, is always terrific. Yeah. They're always so just clean and tight and all the things that you would want out of a $300 concert ticket. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Is that what he's charging? Yeah, pretty much. Wow. I think the last time I saw him, I saw him at the Davy Symphony Hall and that, what an amazing place. Have you ever played there? Yes. What an amazing place. I mean, you can just turn all the mics off and just start talking yeah. in that place. The acoustics are so outstanding in there. And even he said so. He's, you know, in between songs, he went, I'm just amazed at this place. Mm-hmm. You know, I would typically go to see him, really enjoy the music, but I, my ulterior motive for going to see him is my wife loves him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pay attention, young art musicians. That's right. right. <laughs> or young, young, young listeners. Fellas. Who are trying to get at chicks. Uh, <laughs> Harry Connick Jr. will help you. Yeah. He will help you tremendously. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's a great gig. Let's talk about other great gigs that you haven't done yet. Have we finished all the gigs that you have done? Who else have you played oh, with that, are, that you, uh, were proud of or that you? Off the top of my head, I can't think of, you know, it's, I'm, it's, there have been times. Been many yeah, years. Yeah. Yeah. I've, been, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. And here no, I am putting you on the spot. No, no about the, it. the only, you know, the thing that, I look forward, I mean, I love playing the horn. You yeah. know, I mean, I've been doing, I practice every day and I love playing it. So the calls that I like getting are ones for gigs that, uh, you know, like if I get called for the theater and it's a 12 week run, it's like, yeah, yes. I get to play eight shows a week for 12, 12 weeks. That's terrific. You know, or when, you know, Huey's going out this, uh, the, uh, this month is going to be busy and, uh, June, July, and August are gangbusters. They're always busy. Yeah, huh? so it's like those are the kinds of calls I like getting, where I could just get to get out and play and, mm-hmm. and make money too. I mean, it's you know the the theater eight shows a week, you're making money. You know, Huey Lewis on the news, you're making money. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's fun to get out, play the trumpet, and get money. So I mean, as far as like, oh my gosh, am I pining away for a certain call? No. And you know, if something, you know, comes you know comes up, you know, and it's going to last for a while yeah you know that's the because, kind of call that's yeah, great i mean as a musician the one you know, that's going to last like, it's, yeah, exactly because yeah. we you know it's you know my wife is really good as far as budgeting money because it's either feast or famine you, sometimes. you forced it, it right right now in may i have two gigs you know i mean two gigs in the month of may wow you know, it's, month, it's still a month away so something will come up i'm sure but you know all the other you know so we know how to nest egg and you know when you're making a pile of money in one month you don't you know, spend it all. You you save it for the the bad months. Yeah. Let's say that you get a call for a twelve week run, and that's great. But then Huey's going to go out in June, July, and August. I do like staying home and you know sleeping in my own bed. Sure. But if the money is the same, yeah, then I'll go out with Huey because right. it's more fun. That's your home. It, it is fun. Yeah. Um, but Huey, you know, he said to me the first the first time I subbed out, uh, I subbed out to play with the San Francisco Symphony uh-huh. uh, at Davy Symphony Hall. You mentioned Davy Symphony Hall. We did uh, uh, Duke Ellington's Harlem, and they needed a guy to do the, the Cat Anderson sh- uh, scream stuff. And I, you know, I was worried about asking him because I, you know, it was such a good gig. Like I say, we're on their health plan, you know, yeah. uh, profit sharing, you know, retirement, 401k, all this stuff, you know, that they're taking care of us with. And Huey said to me, he goes, Marvin, we pay you a lot, but we don't pay you enough to own you. 
So as long as I take care of the sub, as long as the sub is uh, someone that they like that's going to come in and take care of business, they're fine with me subbing out. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. What yeah, a great very gig, cool. man! He's a, yeah, they're both there. The the band is. I'm really a little bigger people. fan of Huey Lewis than I than I was uh, just half an hour and ago. I'm not saying something because we love the heck out of him. Oh, yes, we yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we do. We wow. think really highly of him. I mean, just so many great stories that are like that. Mm-hmm. He's just he's a human. yeah. No, you never hear anybody say anything bad about Huey no. Lewis for yeah. crying out loud, or anybody involved in the band. Yeah. yeah. You know, and we live in the Bay Area where you would sort of, those stories would leak out Mm -hmm. if someone was a terrible tipper or would hang out at, I, you know what, I wait tables at such and such and he comes in there all the time and I can't stand him. Whenever he comes into the Big Bear Diner, he always gets the cobbler and he never, ever, you know. (laughs) There's no story like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. So now with, your playing schedule, though, in June, July, and August. Here's the tough thing for Marvin because his son's a baseball player. Yeah. Our kids play baseball together. And when your kid's a baseball player, he plays in the summer. And when he plays in the summer and you're in a touring band that is very busy in June, July, and August, that's that's tough. Yeah. Well, that's why I try and go to as many games as I can when I'm around. Yeah. Yeah. But uh Eli plans on going. He wants to yeah, – you've met Eli. Yeah. He's, he's small. He needs to gain weight. And so he's actually going out to this place in the summer. Uh, his name is, uh, Eric Cressy and he works with baseball players, you know, sure. that, all the right exercises and all that. He's n- going to do that. We're going to be out in Boston for a few days. So, I mean, I'm going to actually hook up with Eli while, while I'm out there. You know, he'll be living out in that area. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that is cool. Yeah. I don't know if he's going to pitch. When I'm out there, but at least I'll, I'll see him. But he's going out there to do a pitcher's regiment to, yes, to gain muscle mass. He's, right. he is, uh, I don't know how tall Eli is. He is a small, he is yeah. a small player, mm-hmm. but he throws hard. Does he? Mm-hmm. He throws hard? Yeah. Yeah. He's nipping at 90. Yeah. Oh, he's, really? he's 87. Yeah. And he still hasn't even filled out yet. Huh? No, he's still a, he's 140 pounds. Those Cressies yeah. are smart. Yeah. They, they know what they're doing. So yeah. He'll be all right. Yeah. yeah. Those guys are awesome at that. Yeah. He's kind of like he's he's got a Tim Lincecum like delivery in that you can tell he's throwing the ball from his toes. Mm-hmm. Everything is about slinging that thing. Yeah. So his you know mechanically, uh, I just when I watch him throw the ball, I go, man. I hope all of these things stay healthy and mm-hmm. and pliable. Yeah. Because he's asking a lot of his body. Yeah. Yeah. And it's neat to watch a kid do that. He's obviously been passionate about baseball. For yeah. a long, long time because yeah. I did when, meet him. When he was four, you know how like kids on Saturday mornings, they, they wake up and watch cartoons and stuff mm-hmm. like that. He'd put on, you know, the baseball shows, you know, yeah. ESPN. And, and when he was four, he could name the starting rotation of every major league club. You wow. know, I mean, he just loves baseball. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. When I met him for the first time, I had no idea it was your kid. Mm-hmm. And I went to, um, this was before he played at Laney. Mm-hmm. He was, up in uh it was during the fall season mm-hmm. and he was just there for the weekend mm-hmm. so we just happened to be sitting next to each other and then we'd make comments and i could tell that he knew the players from benicia mm-hmm. so i asked him what was going on with how he knew the players from benicia and he said he was from vallejo and then we sort of talked and this was at the very beginning of the day so and we played a double header that day mm-hmm. So we sat together for a double header Mm -hmm. and it was amazing just to hear him analyze the game to himself in my presence. Oh, cool. Because he wasn't really talking to me. Mm -hmm. He was just sort of picking apart who was doing what Mm -hmm. and what he liked about something or didn't like about something. And I was just kind of an innocent bystander. Mm -hmm. So I was there as an excuse for him to talk about it. Oh, good. Yeah. And it was neat to just be the excuse and hear the. I hope he goes very far, but I think, and you tell me, he may have a future as a commentator. I know that he wants to do baseball for a very long time, you know, in any aspect, either managing, commentating, whatever. I know he loves. The thing is, my kids, I've got three sons, mm-hmm. and uh, I think they were brought up in the right house. You know, the money was never an important thing. I Life is too short to not do something that you love to do. Yeah. You know, so... Um, my, my oldest son, uh, is 28 and he's an electrician and that's, he's always wanted to work with gadgets and stuff like that. He was a Marine for five years and, and he's living his dream. The middle one, the 25 year old is a musician. He's, uh, he's a guitar player 
and and he's living the dream. He's doing doing shows in San Francisco, and he's also playing with cover bands. And Eli is doing what he loves to do. They all go at what they want with reckless abandon. I mean, there's a, there's no uh, you know carrying you know people say don't carry your eggs in one basket. All three of them are are carrying their eggs in one basket and running with it. And, and what's the it. what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. They fail, yeah. and then they have to do something else. But at least they'll have no regrets, you know. Yes. I mean, I know people that said, you know, if I would have, well, even in high school, you know, I'll see people, and they'll say, you know, when we were in high school, I was better than you. I mean, if I would have stuck with it, I'd be better than you right now. And I shrug my shoulders and say, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, you know, who knows? What are you supposed we'll, to we'll, say to that? We'll never know. I mean, it's better to live life with that reckless abandon that my kids do then you know to have regrets later oh man i should have done that i should have tried anyway right. i think and you've raised them that way and yeah there they are the worst that can happen with the three of them is that they could fail yeah oh well as a baseball player you reach a point in your career where somebody takes the baseball out of your hand right and right. that's it mm -hmm. for your career as a player Right. But if you really, really love the game, you can. There are places where you can continue and do something to contribute to the experience. And mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can, one of my favorite people in the baseball world was Tim Flannery mm -hmm. and now Roberto Kelly. Mm -hmm. And they were the third base coach for the Giants and now the third base coach for the Giants. Mm -hmm. And it's just neat to see somebody who gets to be in a baseball uniform. Mm -hmm. As part of the strategy, and you know that I don't know what Tim Flannery did. Did he have a career as a baseball player? Pete would know. Yeah, he's all right. He played for the Padres and Giants a little bit. He was all right. You know, it's just neat to see that when somebody has some passion for something, that they just continue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, the continuing part, right? And everybody who plays baseball at some point is going to be not a baseball player longer than they ever were a baseball right. player. You right. Know? And if he can already at his age. Break down people and things. You can announce, you mm -hmm. can scout. I mean, yeah. I mean, how many young people do you see with the radar gun at a game, at a minor league game, just scouting? You know? Right, right. They have an athletic body, but you're like, you've got a radar gun in your hand. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, your playing career is over, but now you're, you know, is that what that is? That's exactly what yeah. that is. It's those guys moving on. You know? mm -hmm. So it's cool. That's if it's his passion. Yeah, he's four years old. Yeah. It's cool to grow up in the house uh, uh, of an artist, though, someone that can see that. That mm -hmm. makes such a huge difference. And I think when we analyze what's going on with schools and why there aren't music programs in schools or why there's no art in schools, it's not just because we want people to grow up to be an artist or a musician. It's because we want people to grow up with the sense of appreciation for pursuing things in life that make it meaningful. Right. And, you know, whether it's music or baseball or gadgets or whatever it is where you get fulfillment, yeah. you ought to be able to explore that. Do you go back to Vallejo High and, like, talk to people and do stuff like that? I used to, but I haven't in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's just something that, you know, you? I think you're more in touch with it the closer you are to it. And then the further you get from it, the more you're like, well, I, I was going to do that, but I got to go on the road. Yeah, I think that's it. You know, just time. And I think there's also a lot of people just aren't interested. I know that the, the band director there is always interested in me coming down, but I just don't, I don't think that, um, I had to work so hard, mm -hmm. you know, practice so hard, uh, to play. And I mean, I, I have patience for people that aren't good players as long as they're trying hard. Yeah. But I don't have patience for someone who just, you know. Now they're wasting your time. They're not yeah, taking I think it serious. so. I think so. Yeah. It's a professional standard. Yeah. It, to me. That to me is frustrating. You know, if you're sure. trying really hard, you know, I mean, then it's like, it doesn't matter if you're not any good. Right. Because you're going to get better. You right. know, it's, but if you're. Yeah. Arrogant, get, getting better has no choice. It's, it's, it's almost arrogance uh, to yes. say, you know, someone's coming in and yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they're listening and rolling their eyes or whatever. So, so you know, I'd rather not uh, cast my pearls to swine, so to speak. Do you. So, so, <laughs> That's Dennis Eckersley, he pitched from a place of fear of failure. Like, mm -hmm. You know, Mike Tyson, same thing. The other guy's already up and running. They mm -hmm. kind of get up and do that. Do you think that uh, musicians are often wired the same way where like, they can't be the weak link on the stage and so they push harder? Or? I think you don't want to be the weak link on the stage, but uh, it's not a competitive thing either. When I hear other trumpet players, I'm not, oh, man, I hope that guy messes up so I can get his job. Sure. I'm rooting for him. I'm out there and it's like, Ooh, I want that guy to play good. I want him to do what Mick Gillette did to me 30 years ago. You know, I mean, yes. and so. And I mean, maybe some, at some point you return the favor for somebody else. I mean, probably 20 I, times. I could, I could hope favor. so. I could hope that, but I don't know that. Um, I mean, I'm a journeyman and Mick was an artist. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What's the difference? 
Well, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, I got a piece of plumbing in my hand, the trumpet, you know, yeah. and, just, and I just <laughs> go at it, plumbing. you know. But I mean, I think people will be listening to Mick Gillette in a hundred years from now and they won't be listening to me. That makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> Not me, you know. I mean, it's no value judgment. You know, yeah. you need both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what what is it that you think is different from his trajectory as it, a player? It, it, his unique voice. Yeah, he had a, has a very unique voice. Whenever you hear him play, I mean, it's like if if I put on. Um, an obscure James Brown tune that you've never heard before. If I put, if I YouTubed it right now and, mm-hmm. you know, you could hear two bars of it and I, you wouldn't say, now who the heck is that? Right. That's you true. Know, you know, Elvis, who is yeah. that singing? Huh. You know, I mean, it's like, so, I mean, and Mick is that, that guy on the trumpet, you know, it's like you listen to that and it's like, that's Mick Gillette yeah. or it's somebody trying to sound like Mick Gillette. Wow. So your existence as a player has been that you, are able to execute the best. Let's say the best. I know that you're the kind of guy who would go, come on, man. Uh, there are plenty of guys, but there aren't plenty of guys. The truth is that when somebody needs this batch of notes out of a trumpet executed and they need somebody who can come in and, and, and knock it out and play it as perfect as they think it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, never mind what you think. And, and, oh, by the way, you know what? I need to scream every now and again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, then they get you. Mm-hmm. And the difference between that and Mick Gillette is that Mick had a uniqueness about his phrasing and his playing that right. made and his it sound. Better. Yes. Yeah. So you're right. There is room for both. You do need both. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes I don't know if this ever happened that I can say, but I, but I bet it happened where someone went, I just need somebody to come in here and play this thing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I don't necessarily need somebody to come in here and go, you know, this would be really great if you played it like this. And that would be exactly what Mick would do. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, when I sit down, um, I've played for, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of, uh, MDs, music directors. And my goal is to play the trumpet part the way that they would play it if they could and they were in that chair. I mm-hmm. mean, I want, I want to, please them. I want them, I want to be their instrument, you know. So uh, so there have been sometimes uh, people have asked me to do something that internally I think is ridiculous, but I don't care. I want to be able to give that to them. That's what they want. That's what they're paying for. So that's, that's what I'll do. So there, there is a, there's, I don't want to say pride, but I mean, it's, it's a work ethic that I, that I have that I just want to do that the way that they want it done and, and not, not have, you know, not have my own, you know, there are times that they'll say, what do you think? What do you want to, you know, and, and I'll, I'll play it the way I want to play it, uh, at first, but if they want something, they change it, they want something different, then, you know, I want to do that for them without putting a value judgment on it. So there are sports car designers yes. and there are race car mechanics. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes you need the guy who's going to make you go faster. Right. You don't need the guy who's going to design, yeah. you know, the 65 Mustang. You need the guy who's going to take your race car. Listen, we've we've already got a gig. Yeah, we need it to be better. Yeah, it's, ultimately you need both. Yeah, you, you yeah. do. Yeah, because Mick Gillette was a, he was a, a sight composer. Like, I'm going to compose this right now. Yeah, and, he, and that's an unusually rare gift mm-hmm. in any kind of profession. Mm-hmm. But no matter what he does. He will never be the guy that has played. I'm still a young man the most because there will always be other people out there playing it. Yeah, all the yeah, time. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so there yeah. has to be those people that are the journeymen that can come out and say, "Yeah, yeah, I know how to blow that song. Yeah, it's not a problem." Yeah, and uh, so Mick gets the credit for for the composition. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of I've, I've, I've done sessions it. with Mick and. Uh, do you know who Mark Russo is? The guy who plays with Doobie Brothers now. Yeah, he played with the Yellow Jackets for a while, and those guys were are both like dynamos i mean you get in the studio and it's like i had to hold on you know for dear life you know they're making stuff up and it's like okay marvin plays it blah 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 blah. red light let's go bam you know and it's like they're making stuff up all the time and all i had to do was just hang on you know i mean just (laughs) i have i have a good enough ear where i can pick that up but i mean it's like these guys were just like it was like a tornado went through the the studio and you know those people got their money's worth hiring those two guys you know what it's like, Barry Bonds. Okay. You know, and if you, he's hitting third, uh-huh. if you're batting leadoff, 
your job is to get on base. That's yeah. it. You know, you got to get on <laughs> base, man. Get on base. Yeah. You know, he'll yeah. knock you home and, and then come in and you can high five him and all that stuff. But you know what? His job is a lot less impactful if mm-hmm. you don't do yours. Yeah. And that's yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah. So you be, you know, you downplay it and go, Oh, well, you know, my, I was there hanging mm. on, but you know, oh, no, they I'm were there, there going, yeah. Hey, I need somebody who can, who can, yeah. who Keep can over, stay on this ride. Yeah. 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 Marvin can hang in the tornado. Yeah. yeah. Can do it. Right. No, I'm not putting a value judgment on it. I mean, I, mean, I think those guys are more rare uh-huh. than, than people like True. me, but I mean, there's, you need, like you say, you need both. I'm not putting a value judgment on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's mixed gift, right? He can, he can amplify what the rest of the band, the feeling of it is. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't need anybody to show him how to do it. He no. Just knows he, it. he knew it. Yeah. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. We've had you for an hour and I really appreciate this hour. And this has been a great show. Before we go, are you promoting anything? Is there like a record that you've played on recently that you want to let everybody know about or just buy tickets to see Huey Lewis in the news? Yeah. Come in, come in and say hi. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we've got some Bay Area dates coming up. What do you got coming up in the Bay Area? Well, I know we're playing Rodney Strong, uh, which is, I guess that's in Napa or Sonoma. Sonoma. I think. Yeah. yeah. And then we, we do have the Saratoga winery and of I think course. we're doing Wenty again too. Oh nice. man. Yeah, See, so. those might be the three yes. best venues yeah. in the Bay area. Yeah. Really? The Wenty commute is a tough one because, mm. you know, if you go to sound check and you have to be there at five or oh, you know, five yeah, 30, right. you know, as soon as you, you, start, you start going east on 580, it takes forever. Yeah. But once you get out there, the weather's always nice. It's never windy. It's, 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 the beautiful. place sounds it, great. It, it yeah. place sounds great. Yeah. And Saratoga is awesome. Saratoga yeah, is my yeah, favorite yeah. place to see a show yeah. ever. Yeah. And you know, they've, I don't know when the last time you've been there, but they've actually fixed it up. So it's even more comfortable. Well, they fixed the place yeah. up. You yeah. Know. Yeah. I haven't been there since they fixed it up. And I know they fixed it up probably like two or three years ago. Yeah. I think about two or three years ago. Yeah. The last thing I saw there was, I saw Ozo Motley there. Uh, Is that your favorite band? That's my favorite band. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I mention a band, it's my favorite band. That's one of the things that if, uh, the loyal listeners on our show, that means my dad. Uh, the loyal <laughs> listeners, the, those who have listened to all 80 shows will say, oh yeah, here's another one of his damn favorite bands. Ozo Motley is one that comes up. And they're the last band I think I saw at Saratoga Mountain Winery. And man, there is not a bad seat in that place. And the only thing I worried about when I heard that they were fixing it up was, oh no, you're going to screw it up. Yeah. No, it's nicer. It's yeah. a lot nicer. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. it's terrific to hear that. So here's my last question. You're going to go on the road with Huey Lewis. You guys go to all kinds of great places. But what's the place that's not the venue that stands out? Like, I can't wait to go to Rudy's and get the cream corn. You know, or what? what is the thing that you got? Like, this is my favorite part of this job is I get to go to this place. Well, we're going to New York. And, I mean... There's really not much to do there. It's just, <laughs> yeah. 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 just nothing to do it's in New York. So boring. No, in New York. I mean, I like, like I say, I like going to ball games yeah. and including a ball games, you know, triple, double and single A. Yeah. Um, there's this in south of Tampa. There's a place called Dunedin or Dunedin. I forget what Dunedin, it is. Dunedin. Yeah. yeah. And they've got a double A. I mean, I went to a double header there at a double A game. I you paid saw, 15 bucks. I, Eight bucks for the yeah. whole double header wow. and, and yeah. right behind home plate. And I saw a few years ago, well, a number of years ago now, I saw Armando Benitez, you know, pitch an inning, throw 102 mile an hour to these, yeah. you know, these poor double A kids, you know, as, as he was rehabbing. <laughs> so I, you know, I like going to ball games and I like going to museums. Cola, one of the other sax players, Johnny Vermont and I, we go out to eat a lot at a bunch of different places. Oh, yeah. So I look forward to those things. I look forward to posts on Facebook that include barbecue joints. Ah, you guys yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that was messy, wasn't it? <laughs> Just when you yeah. see like Butcher paper yeah. spread out, yeah, and there's right. three dudes sitting on one side of a booth, and there's just butcher paper yeah, everywhere. Face washing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not even a That's wipe. A, yeah, yeah, not, yeah, exactly. A, a trough, yeah. yeah. You know, I hope that you take that up as your hobby, that you document all the greasy places that you eat, mm-hmm. because I just love that. There's just a lore in that that I think matches music. Mm-hmm. It's like, what is just going to give me the most bass pleasure? Right. You know, I'm going to hear something great. I'm going to eat something great. They go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just, it's just me encouraging you to post more pictures of good times and food. Okay. I will. And then my, my last question. Now I have two questions and I'll ask them both and then you can answer them, uh, or, or slough one off. Uh, the first thing is, is there still like 
um, in the age group that we're in, crazy groupie behavior uh, that happens at a Huey Lewis show. And my second question, the one that you'll probably answer, is uh, what are you listening to? Uh, I listen to um, uh, jazz, you yeah. know, and, and most of the, I'm, uh, you know, I listen, I can't get enough of Freddie Hubbard. You know, I listen to a lot of 50s and 60s, you know, jazz, even though there's a lot of great stuff going on now, but mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of where my heart is. You know, uh, I like listening to that. I like listening to a lot of the new gospel music too. There's a lot of good gospel music that I've listened to. And you know what? It's funny because my kid, Eli, uh, he's into country and, uh, he plays some of his country stuff, you know, so there's a lot of good music out there, but mostly jazz. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as the groupies, don't know. I, I really don't, you know, <laughs> because we just, you know, we just avoid all that. Yeah. 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 It seems like you guys would be the act that would be above all of that, mm. but it just, to me, it, you know, you can see like when you were 17 and you saw Motley Crue and you saw yeah. like the 17 year old chicks who were pining to get backstage, like, I've, I've got no chance with that, but Tommy Lee's got a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Is there some like 52 year old dude looking at a 49 year old woman going, God, I've got no shot, but I bet she's <laughs> going to go backstage and Huey's going to get lucky. <laughs> All right. I'm not going to edit that out. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. We appreciate you coming by. Well, you made this easier than I thought it would be. All right. We can make it suck more if you want. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. <laughs> Through editing or yeah. just let me talk oh, more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Marvin McFadden, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs>